welcome everybody. We're back here for one of our later updates in our exciting series of updates from the floor of COP26. And I'm very delighted today to be here with a friend. You know, many of my friends have also visited the Fintorn community. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we've just been meeting each other over the years at the various COPs and really following each other's ways of engaging in the world and in this topic and chat. And his work is actually very dear to my heart. So I have to say a few things about chat. Huh? He is the lead researcher and principal architect of the methodology and models behind Project Drawdown in collaboration with a global team of researchers. Chat designed integrated global models to assess the world's most effective climate solutions and determine if, when, and how the world can reach drawdown, the point in time when the concentration of atmospheric greenhouse gases begins to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. With an interdisciplinary background in public policy, human rights, sustainable development, and environmental conservation, Chad works as a system strategist to build a new regenerative future with cascading benefits to the environment and to human welfare. Yeah, so just, you know, looking at the different ways in which we have these greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, you know, amongst others, really re reaching the atmosphere, but then also looking at how the natural systems of the earth, especially the oceans, the forests, the trees, are able to draw down some of these gases and ground them again. Um, you've built a whole series of solutions, especially to reduce the sources of green gases mm -hmm. and then to increase the sinks of greenhouse That's right. gases. Yeah. So I wonder whether we could just start by hearing from you about your favorite climate solutions. Well, first of all, hi Kosh. It's good to be here and it's good to see all of you on this uh, this broadcast. It's good to be here. Um, so people ask me that all the time. What's my favorite solution? And I have to say, uh, my favorite solution is the system of solutions themselves, because we need all of these solutions, every technology, every practice that we know of. It's an all of the above situation, right? We have to really fundamentally shift the way we do business as a, as a society and as an economy to move away from that business as usual that's inherently exploitative and extractive and move towards a new normal that's by nature restorative and regenerative. So I don't really have a favorite solution i because the solution itself is the system when we envision what that future is that we actually want that's the solution that's my favorite right because we need it all we need it all we can't do it with just the top 10 the top 20 top 40 top 50 we need everything it's an all of the above situation to solve the climate emergency that we've ever that we're facing today and future generations to come this is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced and the decisions that we make today are the most important in the history of our species. In the next 10 years, right, the decisions that we make are the most fundamentally important because they affect us today, mm -hmm. our children tomorrow, and every future generation to come. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a favorite. I love them well, all. I love them all. Well, just to make that more concrete, are there some solutions that you imagine very few of us know about, that very few of us would think of as we think of climate solutions? Well, often when we think about climate solutions and kind of the paradigm of uh, these COPs over the last 26 COPs, right, has focused principally on energy, right? And right. It's, it's important, right? Yeah. Electricity generation, we think about those coal, oil, and gas-fired plants, and that's, that's important. It accounts for about 25% of total greenhouse, uh, global greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. But we often don't think about the nature side, the natural climate solutions, mm -hmm. nature side. And only now, only I think in this COP, we're really seeing nature having a voice 
yeah. at the COP itself. And so people don't tend to think about that. They don't think about the food system itself, right? Mm -hmm. We think about every crust of bread, every drop of oil that goes through the supply chain from production to harvesting, processing, packaging. Think about all of the tin, glass, cardboard, plastic that's being produced in factories, churning out emissions from, from those smokestacks that you see, right? Mm -hmm. And then getting packaged and being delivered all over the world on trucks, trains, boats, and sadly, planes with luxury commodities all over the world in refrigerated containers using hydrofluorocarbons, which are hundreds to thousands of times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. They're being stocked in our grocery stores at a, a overstock to meet a presumed consumer demand. And when consumers do purchase that food, we waste about 30% of it. But we also- 30% of all food is wasted. Lost or waste across yeah. that supply chain. So if we think about, we even think about the, the you know, the turning on our electric stoves or our gas stoves, the energy that's consumed to cook our food. And that's, if we're lucky, because three, uh, up to 2.7 to 3 billion people on this planet are using cook stoves, open flames, right? Open cook stoves, right? And they don't have the luxury we have to turn on an electric stove, let alone one that's powered by renewable energy, right? And then sadly, so much of it gets wasted in the landfill where that food decomposes and emits methane, which is far more potent, 28 to 36 times, 36 times more potent than greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide on a 100-year time scale. On a 20-year time scale, which we have to think about because methane is a short-lived gas, it's up to 86 times more potent. So my point is when we think about the food system itself, it surprises a lot of people because we don't think about the food that we consume every day being a source of emissions but every step of the supply chain, every single step, it represents the system as a whole. So when we think about that system of solutions that I was you know, referring to as my favorite solutions, I think, I think the food system itself is a great representation of, of how that system operates, how we live in a global system of systems, all interconnected. And when we trace that crust of bread or that drop of oil across the supply chain, it becomes very obvious. But all the energy, all the emissions all that go through that supply chain. And then that offers us the opportunity at every step of the way for solutions to reduce food loss and waste, to transform our packaging, right? To have a, instead of having, you know, uh, materials that are extracted from the earth, we can produce an economy of life where materials are made from the stuff of life itself. We can switch from to from burning the uh, 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 burning uh, petrol from our, our tailpipes and from those trucks and from the trains and from the jet fuel. We we can be powered by electricity or biofuels. Right? Mm -hmm. We can have solutions across the entire chain. We don't need hydrofluorocarbons. There are natural refrigerants that are, all, are alternatives that we can use today. Yeah. So this is what excites me when you think about the food we eat. Yeah. Every time you pick up a food, you can see the solutions across the chain, mm. across the entire system. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, and it feels like, you know, just knowing also the intricacy and the systemic nature mm. of your, you're kind of a solution finder and you mine the information of the world, mm. right? Yeah. And especially systemic connections around the world to mm -hmm. look at where are those solutions like a discoverer yeah. of solutions yeah you know? and it feels like that's a lot of mind work yeah right for sure yeah. so i wonder how being here and speaking for solutions mm. how that actually feels to you internally in your inner nervous system your inner world yeah. you know and yeah. how how is your body and your heart part of the solution that you bring to the world. I mean, how do you manage to look after yourself while you do this? Well, work? I mean, COP is a very unique circumstance because <laughs> we're running around from all over the point, you know, just jumping everywhere, trying to bring solutions to the table. And yeah. to be honest, not a lot of solutions are being talked about here at COP, not mm. real solutions, real workable technologies and practices. We talk about the concepts, we talk about the sectors and a lot of nice words that are inspirational, but where are the actual technologies, the real solutions, the actions that we can take starting today to get us on that pathway to stopping global warming mm -hmm. and towards the re regenerative future that we know we need, right? Mm -hmm. 
well, there's a lot of talk and, and not a lot of real solutions out there. So that's what I do. I spend most of my time thinking about solutions. And when you're in that space, when you actually see the solutions and as part of that system of systems, you're fill, I'm filled with optimism. You know, I was, on a, I was on a podcast not too long, similar to this, um, Live Wide Awake. And I was asked, you know, why are you, you always seem eternally optimistic, even in the face of all this challenge and in the face of cough, right? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people, you know, just feel down about here sometimes at cough, right? But I don't, I feel really excited because that vision of that regenerative future that I know that we can get to with real existing technologies and practices that are already scaling, that are scientifically uh, valid, data-driven. They're, they're being applied all over the world. They have more cascading benefits than they have trade-offs to, mm -hmm. to people. We want them whether or not global warming was even a problem and they're readily available. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually filled with, with a lot of optimism and excitement because this is right. We have to make those decisions as the most important decisions that we're gonna make as a species in our history of our species but we make those decisions and suddenly in that future, that regenerative future is available to us. It's a world of opportunities. We can envision that. And that fills me with hope and not just sort of hope and wishful thinking, but real actions, concrete. concrete right. Mm -hmm. So we need, to, we need to blend and walk the pathway between inspiration, which I think we try to do, like visioning what that future is and having those, those nice words but then also knowing and understanding what the real solutions are, aggregating what humanity already knows and reflecting back, reflecting back. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and I think, you know, for us here, being here for the past two weeks, and I feel like many of you have been here for the past two weeks or one and a half weeks with us. Um, our sense has been a lot that there has been a change of atmosphere mm. and air that they're in the era, that something is happening around the awareness around climate change, especially young people, but also mm -hmm. many others really connecting the dots and really going full into transformation. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, we see also from this preliminary agreement that has just come out that the actually, actually the nationally determined contributions lag behind mm -hmm. and they seem to be expressing the old way of doing things you know trying to put our feet down and just put mm. the brake on and take things slow well there's another wind of willingness to create true transformation yeah and yes i wonder how you perceive that yourself this kind of tension between the willingness to change and something in the system holding us back well, I think, you know, a lot of the, oh, first of all, I don't come to COPS with expectation that negotiators are going to come up with the grand plan and finally do what's being, what needs to be done, right? So I don't, I don't come with that expectation. I have hope that uh, year after year, COP after COP, they're going to get better and better. And maybe one day they will, but I don't, I don't want to go there with that expectation because coming in with that expectation too often you're gonna be disappointed. Instead, I come to COPS to connect with people like you. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, like Clover Hogan, like mm -hmm. Alexandria Villanueva, like Shia Bastida, like so many other youth uh, activists, um, solutionists, people who are actually really and truly dedicated to that regenerative future, right? And understanding what the solutions actually are and coming together. We are here at COP and we're finding each other. We're, we're finding our tribe. And the tribe is constantly expanding and growing and becoming stronger. And it's an equal, we're becoming that ecosystem of solutions that we can live and breathe and see that regenerative future in reality as we come together at these COPs. Mm. And that's really, really, really important. Really important. And the more that ecosystem grows, and interacts with those negotiators, the policymakers, businesses, etc. the more we're going to be able to influence them uh, to start walking that walk along with us. That will take more time, but we can still do it. Like we can still uh, uh, have that hope and, and start uh, really working on the solutions themselves because that, that ecosystem is coming together. So it's really, for me, cops are about the community around 
uh, around the negotiators, not any expectation that the negotiators are going to uh, come out of those doors uh, with with the you know the the, the definitive we will com commitment to do this because that's just you can't have that expectation. Now that's amazing. It it reminds me of the imago cells that develop mm. in the decaying caterpillar mm. as the butterfly is starting to come into being and the connections that are made between those cells. And that also brings me to the, the third point that you speak about in Drawdown, which is improve society is what it's called, fostering equality for all mm -hmm. and focusing in, like the main solution I saw was around health and education. That's right. And I'm really wondering, where is the solution of this networking? Ah, yes. You know, because yeah. what you speak about, mm -hmm. what is the most important to you coming to COP is what I would also say, what I found to be one of the most potent mm -hmm. ingredients to real change and transformation is that aspect of community building, Absolutely. networking, yeah. transformative, transforming mindsets and consciousness. And, you know, what we mm. might call, and we'll be speaking on Friday to Karen O'Brien uh, about, um, you know, um, yeah, the social change that yeah. can just, you yeah. know, how collective change can happen yeah. um, in ways that we can't predict. So quantum social change, yeah. what, what yeah. would that mean? Yeah. And I wonder how from your, you know, you have a more scientific mind, and I guess these things are harder to measure, shifts in consciousness, yeah. networks, et cetera. So how yeah. would you be able to bring that into your toolbox of solutions? Thank you. I mean, that's a really good question. I'm really happy actually that Karen is coming <laughs> later on. Friday. You should all make sure you watch it. Karen's fantastic. Um, also one of our earliest advisors at Project Drawdown right. um, and a good friend and colleague. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I want to say a few things. First of all, when I define a solution to climate, a climate solution, what that means is that it has a direct impact, a direct impact on uh, the atmosphere, right? So it's a technology or practice that is, can be scalable and has an impact on reducing emissions directly. Then there are things like accelerators. How do we actually uh, accelerate those, uh, the adoption and implementation of those technologies and practices that have the direct impact yeah, on the atmosphere that's helpful, yeah. so that's where community comes in yeah that's where uh act shifting capital comes in where politics comes in where where that network where we can we can activate together and really drive and accelerate those solutions moving forward to actually have the impact right so that's why you don't see that uh at, on the list because i can't quantify the direct impact of atmospheric reductions as you know, a, a greenhouse gases directly from that accelerator. What we can do is activate that mycelium network that we should be emulating. We that's that's really a, one of the most powerful accelerators we can have. We as a species start to act like a mycelium network and see the system as an integrated whole and activate together all these solutions together. I think that that is a really powerful accelerator to get us on that track towards the regenerative future. But I also want to say another thing, Kosha, because a lot of folks think that I'm a, a atmospheric scientist. I'm not, actually. You know, Paul Hawken, Amanda Ravenhill, and myself, when we started Project Drive, none of us are scientists by the classical definition of it. My background uh, is actually in the nexus between sustainable development, environmental conservation, and local and indigenous people's rights and well being. And the reason I work on climate and was drawn to drawdown, drawn to create drawdown was because these issues are at the front lines of a changing of our changing climate, right? Uh, our biodiversity is under threat. Local and, and indigenous peoples uh, and communities are under threat. The poorest people in the world are the ones who are most affected. Women and girls most affected, coastal communities most affected by our decisions that we make today, right? And so when you're in that space, you're confronted right, right, right from the beginning with uh, climate mitigation adaptation strategies. And that's where I went into this space. And when we create a drawdown, yes, it's scientifically driven. Yes, it's uh, uh, rigorous and it's an aggregation of data. And yes, it's complicated models. I designed those. It's true. It's true. I mean, I, I do have a quantitative background, but I'm also a, histor I'm a historian. So I, 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 
really, you know, push back this notion that we need to be scientists to tell the world what to do, right? Science has its place, but we also need to be connected as humans. Think about the, uh, the human history and how we've, and institutions and how they've formed and how they can change. Science isn't gonna tell us that, right? So, so, so we really need to not just quantify the numbers. The numbers are there to support what we, uh, to support the solutions, to really identify what they are and to map them and to give us a, a context. But, you know, we have to come together, right? We have to think about the institutional change needed to make these solutions actually happen, right? So this is, this is why it's not just science, it's science and it's inspiration. It's coming together in that collaborative world. Like for 25 years, we focused our entire way of thinking on this subject and so many other challenges, so many other challenges on a fixing a problem driven by fear of what can happen. And in a, in a, in a, a space of conflict and competition of ego, right? And we need to shift that paradigm to one of solutions because they're all in front of us. They're right there in front of us. So many solutions uh, driven by the possibility of what those solutions can achieve and to do so from a space of collaboration. And that creates the opportunities. That's the opportunity for the future that we actually want. And those, those are words, that's talk. But when that's backed up then in turn also by the science, that's where I think we can move forward. Yeah, brilliant. You know, and I would, I would really love to, because I know I love Project Jordan. And every time I go to the website, I feel like this narrowing it down on what can be measured in terms of the atmosphere, it's as if we draw the circle too small, you know? Mm. And I believe what I'd love to work with you on next and with other scientists around the world is to really see how we can quantify and also qualify quantum social change mm. and how we can actually measure what you call an accelerator in terms of how that unleashes all those mm -hmm. solutions in a way where that is actually what either has drawdown happen or not happen, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of the decisive factor in mm -hmm. the system, you know, and I, yeah, I just believe that we can go there. And if we speak about solutions in too many spheres, still the inner world of humans yeah. and the interconnected of you, interconnectedness of humans is not visible fully. Yes. You know, it's as if yeah, climate change yeah. is something happening out there. And what is happening in here is disconnected from it. Yes. You know? And I'd really yeah. love us to change that. So maybe that's something we can uh, explore. I'd be happy to. I absolutely agree. I think there's there's a lot of work to be done. And, and Drawdown is, it wasn't designed to be the beginning and end of the system of solutions that we, yeah, we constructed. Right. It was designed yeah. explicitly to be a list of technologies and practices, yeah. but that's just one piece piece yeah. of it, right? Yeah. So we need to figure out a lot more how we can improve the way we do business as a society and as an yeah. economy to yeah. move towards that new normal of restoration mm -hmm. and, and regeneration. And that's and that's not, you know, that's not um, just the solutions and technologies. That's an entire new mindset, a new way of being where where well being for people and planet is at the core of what we do as a species. Right now it's not, because you said it's so distant, we're separated. Yeah. But in that regenerative future that I believe in, that I think we need to go to, well-being is at that core. Well-being for people and planet and where justice, equity, and inclusion are embedded in everything that we do, yeah. right? Because that's, that's the future that we want. Now we have some very serious decisions to make now that we have to make now. We have 10 years. I mean, give or take, I mean, it's not so definitive, of course, but, you know, we have a short window to make these decisions about what we can do for climate change that's happening right now. We can get it out, we have to get on it. And, you know, so first and foremost, let's find out what this, these solutions are that can stop global warming, right? And then let's see it as a system of solutions taken together and let's move forward. And, and, and then 
at the same time embed the embed the uh, uh, justice, equity, and inclusion into the implementation of the solutions themselves, right? And um, I would love to work with you more on exploring how to activate us, how we can catalyze more of that mycelium network amongst each other and amongst this community here and see how we can really accelerate solutions for it. Yeah, wonderful. So I look forward to that continuing conversation and collaboration. And I want to really invite you all to go and have a look at Project Drawdown's website. Super interesting, just to have a look. And um, Barrett, was that you just raising your hand? I just saw totally spot on, loving this dialogue. I'm just going to have a little look at some of what you've written. Um, yeah, great. Well, thank you all for listening today. And I really want to give a huge thanks to you because I know how busy you are here bringing the solutions to the tables in different realms. And I would love to continue this conversation also between us and the Pocket Project and you yeah. and Rule Down and looking at how we can combine and Karen and others, mm -hmm. you know, how can we combine yeah. quantum social change, integration of trauma, global social witnessing with the acceleration of solutions. Yes, I'd be happy thank to. You, thank you, Kosha, and thank you all. Yeah, go well. Thank you, be everyone. Well.